When you blow a steady stream of air over an open tube, uh, it can make a musical sound. This is true for a flute or pan flute. You can even do it with a bottle. So I blow. You can uh, make it make a, a nice uh, musical sound. Uh, also with a clarinet, I have a little clarinet mouthpiece here. If you blow a steady stream of air over here, it's a bit hard to do it, but if you blow it just right, it makes a, a, a sound. And if it was attached to a clarinet, it would make a more musical sound. And here we have a little animation, which is showing uh, the inside of your mouth when you're playing that clarinet. And so what happens is there is a, uh, a pressure set up in your lungs um, by the muscles in your diaphragm and your rib cage that pushes, squeezes the air up through your trachea and your larynx and in through your, through your mouth. And then it goes into uh, the clarinet. And so your, um, your lips close down on the mouthpiece. You can see that this wood piece of wood here is called the reed. That's, uh, that's clamped onto the mouthpiece, but the end of the reed uh, is just up against the opening here, and it is able to bend. So when you blow a steady stream of air in through this opening, it causes the reed to move up and down, up and down. And in re real life, this would happen much faster. This is the vibration which forms the primary vibration, which then uh, uh, gives you the sound in the clarinet. So the question in both of these cases is why does sending a steady stream of air over the opening or through the opening in the clarinet cause these vibrations? Well, first I'm gonna show you another animation. We're gonna talk about Bernoulli's principle. Okay, so in this animation, what you're seeing is air that is flowing through a tube. And it goes in the tube over here on the right and out the tube over on the left. And I've put little air particles in here. And what happens with this tube is that it narrows right around here. And uh, there's an, an idea in physics of continuity, which is the same amount of air which goes in at this side has to come out at this side, since the, the total number of air particles at any moment is not changing inside this tube. So. If you think of all these uh, air particles going through this part, uh, if they get squeezed together uh, in this part, they have to go faster. And you can even see that if you look at one of these particles. It's going pretty slowly over here on the right uh, part of the tube. And then when they get all squished together, they actually speed up quite a bit. And, uh, and, and they go about twice as fast over on this side. And this is... Uh, you can think of water flow. If you have a hose and put your thumb over the end of the hose, it speeds up that flow of water. You see it in rivers as well. Uh, if uh, a river gets narrower uh, or shallower, uh, then that flow speeds up. We call that the rapids. If then widens out and goes to a deep part of the river, the flow rate slows down. And it's the same uh, with air in a column like this. Uh, but the question is, and Bernoulli asked this question, how exactly do these particles speed up? And, and why would they speed up? And what is the force which is causing them to accelerate? We need a force in this region right here pushing towards the left. Well, the answer is it turns out to be a pressure force. All of these particles are jiggling around and uh, bumping into each other and pushing each other. And when they're crowded together, those pushing forces are converted into this forward momentum. So we uh, have a high pressure over on the right and low pressure on the left. So we can draw that. Here we've labeled H for high pressure on the right and L for low pressure on the left. And this difference in pressure uh, from the slow moving uh, air to the fast moving air uh, creates this net force to the left in this area. Bernoulli's principle is that when the speed of airflow increases, it is accompanied by a reduction in the internal pressure. Conversely, if the speed of airflow decreases, it's accompanied by an increase in pressure. So, okay, back to the bottle now. We know that this mo moving air will tend to have a lower uh, pressure 
than the, than the stationary air, how does that set up a vibration at the top of the bottle? Well, I have another animation for that. Okay, so here I'm showing uh, the inside of a person's mouth uh, that's blowing over the top of a bottle. And what initially is set up here is, since this is moving air, it's lower pressure over the top of the bottle and higher pressure inside the bottle. And what that does is that allows air to be pushed upward out of the bottle. But as that happens, it takes away this uh, pressure difference because you're emptying the bottle somewhat to the point where now the bottle, which since it's emptier, is at the same pressure as this uh, lower pressure moving air above. But this, you can see that air has started moving out of the bottle and so it overshoots until it actually empties the bottle uh, to the point where now the bottle is at a lower pressure than the moving air above. And so I've reversed this H and L. And then what that does is that reverses the flow of air so that the air is now flowing into the bottle and that fills up the bottle, elim first eliminates the pressure uh, difference and then actually creates uh, another pressure difference which just brings us right back to the beginning. So as it goes on, it goes high, low, high, low. You have a pressure vibration and that uh, is the first vibration for a sound wave. And what this should remind you of was uh, before we talked about simple harmonic motion and in particular we talked about a pendulum. Well a pendulum can start with uh, a potential energy if you pull it up towards the left and then as you let it go it speeds up until it reaches equilibrium which is hanging straight down and but now it's moving right uh, towards the right the green arrow is showing its velocity so it overshoots its equilibrium and goes up to an opposite uh, high potential uh, over on the over on the right and, and it stops and then it reverses because it's getting pulled back towards equilibrium but again when it gets to equilibrium it overshoots and then gets back up to its original position so you're sort of sloshing between potential energy uh, where there's a uh, uh, something out of equilibrium to kinetic energy where it's in equilibrium but there's things moving so it goes back and forth and so the exact same thing that's going on in the bottle simpler harmonic uh, motion is sort of happening uh, in a pendulum there so that's how that relates so lastly i want to return to the clarinet we have a reed there and we know that blowing across uh, the top of that reed causes it to to vibrate up and down so how does that work exactly well i don't have an anim animation but i think i'll try to show you uh, using this bendy ruler as the reed so pretend that this is the reed and what happens is I blow a steady stream of air over the top of the reed into, I guess, in between the reed and the mouthpiece of the clarinet. And what that does is it creates a, a reduced pressure above uh, the reed and that, so there's higher pressure underneath the reed than above, uh, and that pushes or pulls the, the reed upward. But when, when that happens, it actually compresses this airflow up against the mouthpiece and will increase the pressure there. And then, uh, so it'll, it'll go through an equilibrium and then it'll overshoot equilibrium uh, until it's being pushed back uh, towards equilibrium and then the reed goes down and then you're back to where you started. The airflow over top, reducing the pressure and pulling it up. So in, in both of these cases, the bottle and the clarinet, the energy source is you blowing the the air this steady stream of air and the first vibrations is uh, set up due to Bernoulli's principle and then uh, something which causes something to to oscillate